Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews Municipal Month, and I am pleased and actually very honored to have our guest on the show today. A little bit of a backstory. I have known our guest since 2013 when I first moved out to Lloydminster, Alberta, Saskatchewan from Ontario. Uh, her and I got to know each other through politics, through the Progressive Conservative Association, and Richard Starkey, who we are hoping to have on later on. She is now a sitting member of the Lloydminster City Council, and I'm pleased to have her on to talk about Lloydminster politics, herself, and of course, tourism. Please welcome to the show, my friend, and I'm going to say that with sort of respect because you are my friend, Councillor Laura Lee Marin. Councillor, thank you so much for doing this. Chris, thank you for the invitation. I'm When you reached out to me, I was absolutely thrilled, first of all, to see the work that you're doing and continue to do in telling people's stories and, and in being that news reporter that you are and always looking for those good stories to tell. And we really loved having you in Lloydminster and, and being part of our news media here. You kept people on their toes. And I think that was a, a good thing. And, and we certainly missed you since you've left. So my well, pleasure. <laughs> Two seconds in and I'm already about to start bawling my eyes out, <laughs> Councillor. But let's get this interview going. And you are going to be asked the exact same question I've asked every single politician, candidate to be politician, the exact same question. And that is, Councillor, where did your sense of duty to serve come from? Oh, what a great question, Chris. So in the family I was raised in, rural family, farming family, um, we were always raised to give back to the community, to be part of community, to be part of solutions. When someone was going through a difficult time, um, that was our responsibility to take care of others. And so I think that, you know, we learned that at an early age and how that translated, you know, through my high school years, being part of the student representative council, um, which was just a thrill for me to be part of that. And then starting to, you know, we took a break when we were raising kids, we always were giving back to community and really invested, but we, we weren't involved in politics. And we started to step back into that world, my husband, Henry and I, and, and then we met this fellow, Richard Starkey. And for anyone who hasn't met him, uh, he's an extraordinary person and uh, was a, a very, uh, an, an MLA that was, had very great integrity and um, understanding of issues. And I thought, boy, I need to get really involved in politics. And so I uh, stepped back into that ring. And, and here I am in 2022, uh, two years into my term as a municipal councillor and just pinch myself loving every minute of it. So let's talk about 2020 here for a second, because in 2020, you decided that that was the election that you were going to put your name forward to be a city councillor. Was there an issue in Lloydminster that was pressing that you thought you wanted to address that you thought you might be the best person to advocate for that issue on the city council stage? Or was there a pressing issue in your life that you said, you know what, now is the time to get involved? You know, I had always um, thought at one point in my life I would be an elected official. I wasn't sure what level of government that would be at. But we had moved from the farm into Lloydminster, and, and Lloydminster had always been our community, but now it was our home and our community. And so I started to look around the community and, and get to know people and, and think that, you know, maybe I have something that I could offer to the city of Lloydminster and its residents. And that would be um, just... An, an ability to listen and really hear what the issues are. Um, I, I like big ideas and I like to kind of explore what, what those are and, and what solutions we could come up with together. And so I started to think about, you know, my life and, and my ability to connect with people and communicate and, and to be really collaborative. And I thought, I think I can bring that to city council. And so the decision was for me to run for, for city council and what a great ride that was 
Uh, was it an easy decision? Was it an easy decision to put your name forward? Because putting yourself out there, I've had the pleasure to do it a few times. And I can tell you, mine have not been as successful as yours. But I, <laughs> I, I know putting yourself out there politically to put ideas out there to talk about yourself personally, and also to pitch ideas that will better your community can sometimes seem over uh, overwhelming for you. Was it or was it a easy few months of campaigning for yourself well it was it was a great time for campaigning and i loved it but it was terrifying i have to say that um what if people rejected me what if they what if they don't like what i have to say and i was constantly reminding myself that if they don't like what you have to say then you need to listen better to them to understand what the issues are from them and and so to really be able to speak back to them about that is an issue and and how could we tackle that together and so I had so many great conversations we door knocked the whole north side of the tracks of of Lloydminster my husband and I and uh, apparently that's never been done before and then we did other areas of the community as well and and we just had such a great time um, putting together the campaign and I had this amazing campaign manager Jesse Mann I don't know if you ever met Jesse but she's just dynamite and and so we had this, you know, little campaign team and some advisors and some people who came in and, and really talked to me about what the issues were that they could see in their perspective and, and to share what their ideas were for Lloydminster. Because I really wanted to know from our residents, what's your vision for Lloydminster? I could tell them mine, but I really wanted to hear what their vision was. So I was terrified to the last moment of them um, sharing the, the results from the election. I didn't know what the result would be. I never once made an assumption that um, you're engaged in community, you'll be elected. I, I never once made that assumption. I thought I have to work for every vote. And, and I did that. You, you are the only politician I will have ever had on the show where I can ask this question. Your city lies in two provinces, Saskatchewan and Alberta. You are the border city. Running municipally must be an interesting, unique experience when you have to deal with two provincial governments, because I know from my time in Lloydminster that some issues, some laws are provincially Alberta and some laws are provincially Saskatchewan. And as a municipal uh, uh, candidate, you have to be up on both sides of the, the policies and the governments of both sides. How was that experience for yourself? Well, that was, that was, interesting. And, and I mean, I've always known that, but when you're actually in the role of a counselor and you're having to face those issues every day and try to determine, so where are we? Um, we also have, so both provincial legislation, but we have a charter that um, helps us to, to govern and, and legislate our city within the provincial legislation. So, um, you know, in, in health, we look to Saskatchewan and in education, we look to Saskatchewan and some other things we might look to Alberta, but on, on many occasions we report to both. And so it's finding that balance and we have this tremendous leadership in our city. Um, I'm so privileged to work with a mayor and council that all had served a term already. And so I was the only newbie. So it was just me that had to be caught up and, and they're so gracious and generous with their time to do that. And then our city leadership, they're really um, making sure that we have the information we need to make good decisions. And well, you know me, Chris, you know that I tend to be a little bit of an advocate. And so, so when, we, when something's not working for us, my first thought is we need to advocate on behalf of our city and our, our residents to make sure that this works for our one city, one team kind of approach that we have to, to the city of Lloydminster. I want to go back to October of 2020, and I want to go back to election night for you. Um, the polls have closed. You, it's out of your hands and the polls start coming in. What are you thinking at this time? And what are you thinking once that check mark gets put beside your name and it's officially declared that Councillor elect Laura Lee Marin will be serving on the city council in this mm -hmm. new term? So, so some overwhelming gratitude for the people who cheered me on, for the people who took their time to go out and put an X beside my name, who hosted campaign signs and conversations and really were you know, supporting me in my efforts to serve the city. 
So even as I'm speaking now, I can feel the emotion. So we had a small group of uh, family and close friends. My daughter um, was taking her master's down in Montreal and she flew in the night before the election day. And, and I was busy downstairs working on who knows what, probably nothing important. And my husband said, somebody's at the door for you. And it's freezing cold night. It's actually November 16th and it's freezing cold. And I'm like, you left them outside? <laughs> them in so I opened the door and there's my daughter standing there so that was you know she she did her master's in political science and so she came to support her mom in in the final day and um, was a great support through the campaign but it was just that that started the emotions and I um I just had this small group of people and we were watching the screen and watching the results come in and and in my mind I was like is it possible that I'll have the privilege of serving this community on council. Um, I serve the community in many ways, but to serve it on council is this extra privilege. And, and so I think I did a, like a big jump up and a little bit of a scream and a woohoo when, when the final results came in. And, and I just looked at my team and said, wow, thank you. <laughs> you, you, you run in a campaign mm -hmm. when COVID-19 is pretty prominent. Uh -huh. So the traditional campaigning that you and I have been known to know is not the one you probably ran in in 2020 because it was the height of the pandemic and there was social distancing issues. And how was that experience? Because I can imagine someone like yourself who I've known for some time, you were one of these people that you like to get out there and you like to glad hand and like to meet people. I can imagine that aspect of the campaign was a little bit challenging for yourself. Well, you know, I like you're right. I like to get up close and personal, and I I realized through the through COVID how much I touch people and and maybe get into their space, even you know have to be a little more <laughs> responsive to the their cues of, of not getting into their space. So I had to learn a lot, and and campaigning was certainly you know different than than we had maybe done in the past with with some of the other campaigns we had supported, and I you know typically shake hands, and so so that awkwardness. Um, was a bit of a challenge for me. And so I would go up and ring a doorbell and I'd step back, back down off the stairs and, and, you know, I left something in your mailbox and, you know, so, so that we weren't getting close to exchange things. So that was, that was a learning experience. And then, you know, the debates were, were televised. You didn't have an audience to kind of take the energy from for, for your responses or to, gauged how you were doing in the debates you're just speaking to a camera so there was some learnings there um i'll have to tell you a funny story it's, it's not funny it's i'm still kind of horrified that i did this i walked up to a door of a neighbor knocked on the door and uh and stood there and and i didn't have a mask on and it was my very first day out door knocking and and then i stepped down off this off the step to the sidewalk and he said, did you not read the sign? And he has this big yellow sign on his door. And I'm like, no, <laughs> no, I didn't. And, and what so did the sign say? Like, I'm assuming don't knock on the door or no soliciting. They didn't, they didn't want anyone coming there because of COVID. They were very concerned and rightfully so with some health issues concerned about COVID. And, and so they didn't want anyone coming to their door period. And here I am all excited, you know, got my lawn sign for you. <laughs> and I know. And, and so that was just a huge reminder to me that be sensitive to others, pay attention to what's going on, read the signs on the door before you knock. And um, anyhow, we, we did kind of work through that. And, and I think in the end, he perhaps voted for me, but um, I, I, I'm not, but it was a real learning thing for me. So COVID definitely brought its challenges. Um, so you you talked about the butterflies that you had on election night when you get officially declared the councillor elect for the city of Lloydminster. But those butterflies leave very quickly because you are now sworn in as the next councillor. And I want to know from you, what is the weight and responsibility that you had on your shoulders the moment you walked into that first council meeting? Because I can imagine you've been in that council room many times, like I was in my time in Lloydminster, and 
being there as a spectator and being there as a counselor who now is going to dictate where money goes, the issues that are going to be facing your city, the how to solve the issues of your city can be overwhelming. So for you, what was that weight and responsibility that you put on your shoulders to ensure that you always did what was best for your city? Well, true confessions. The very first day I felt um, a very heavy weight and thinking, what have I done? I'm now responsible for, for some very important decisions that need to be made um, and will impact the future of our community. So I take that very seriously. Um, so I've been on council now coming up to two years. Uh, I'm just starting now to feel like I'm not the bobblehead, you know, <laughs> asking my questions. And you know me, Chris, I ask a lot of questions. And um, sometimes I'm, I'm grateful that another counselor has asked the question already. And, and so I have my answer. And other times I'm annoyed that they asked my question because I wanted to be the one asking that question. But it's a really, it's uh, an important, um, it's an important job. It's a huge responsibility. And one of the things that I, I knew going in that I knew some stuff, but I didn't know enough stuff. <laughs> there, I have such a steep learning curve. And so um, even, you know, understanding municipal development plans, we're doing a new one now. And so this will be my first time through that whole process. And so I'm just soaking it in, asking the questions I need to ask, reading all that I can. Um, this is a bit geeky, but before I, before I um, put up my first campaign sign, I read all of the master plans and, and all of the strategic plans on the city's website so that I could have a sense, you know, the fire master plans over 400 pages. So did I read it in detail? I skipped some stuff, I'm going to tell <laughs> you, but I, that I thought were important for me to know. And, you know, I met with the fire team and some different teams, but there's so much to learn. And it really is a team um, effort. If, if somebody comes into municipal politics thinking, I'm going to show them and I'm going to change things, that's the wrong approach. You have to come in willing to listen to others, to their opinions, um, to what the, the evidence or data shows you, to what the community has to say. And that we've missed a lot of that. You know, we used to host these Your Voice events and, and people would come out and we'd rent the service sports center and people would come in and, and have their say. And so we're just, we've had one now um, post COVID. So, so I don't even know where I was going with that, but it's a, it's a tremendous responsibility to what serve was, your community. What was the biggest learning curve? Because like you said, you're halfway through your first term as city councilor. What was the biggest learning curve? And the thing that you thought to yourself, I didn't expect this when I first got elected. I thought this was going to be either easier on this issue, or I thought it was a less complicated as, as outsiders usually have on municipal politics, because it's usually never the simple solutions that councillors always take because they have a lot more information than the say residents may have. Yeah. So, so how much information was certainly, you know, a steep learning curve that like reading our packages every week and then knowing the questions to ask, but I think it's the technical, the technical pieces. So, um, you know, we went through annexation and, um, and that was a, a long process. And fortunately some of my colleagues on council um, were part of that in their first term. And so they carried through with that until the annexation um, decision came down from the province. And so, um, but listening to them and understanding that, but the technical things around building a wastewater treatment facility. And now we're looking at, you know, building Lloydminster Place and event um, facility. And so listening to the, the technical pieces of that, um, going to the, like, sometimes I didn't know the questions to ask because I, I just simply didn't know. I didn't have experience doing that. And so I, I find myself slowly getting into the groove and understanding and, and feeling confident in asking those questions. Um, we did a tour this year post COVID now um, of all of our facilities in the city. Wow, I learned so much and, and it helped me to understand so much around you know, our service delivery for, for water and wastewater and, and you know, the, the dump, the, the garbage dump and all of the sports centers and, ha and behind the scenes how things operate. So it was really uh, good for me. And I think um, everybody just said, yeah, we need to do that because we have a new counselor that into everything. And it was good for us, a good bonding um, time for us as well as council two, two days that we did that. 
as as the new counselor, you, you've mentioned it a few times, but I'm going to just clarify here, just in case I'm taking it in the wrong context. But as the new counselor, as the only one that was first elected, I know Councillor Whitting did also get reelected, but he had a term off of council as well. Whiting, sorry, um, he came back after a, a, a little bit of a absence. Um, while the connection was there for the majority of the councillors, and I might be wrong on Councillor Whiting, am I? Has no, you're correct. He, okay. He had okay. A yeah, okay. Whew. I was like, oh, did I just <laughs> get that wrong? <laughs> okay. Um, you're not saying that the relationship with the other councillors was, com uh, was sort of combative with you, are you? Because it sounds like you came in and it was, you're, they're asking the questions you wanted to ask and you didn't get the training that they did because they were already on council. You guys had a good working relationship, right? It's completely the opposite. Of okay. That. I just wanted to so, confirm that because yeah, I was like, yeah. I, I feel like she's going this way, but I want to double check. Oh, so, so being the new counselor, I think they all kind of wanted to make sure that, that they helped me along and they've been so generous with their, their time and patient with me and making sure that, Oh, Councillor Mayor may not know that. So let's, let's, you know, go back a little bit and, and kind of bring her up to speed. And so I appreciate that so much. They, um, I, I was fortunate because I knew all of the counselors already. I didn't know them well, but I had met them all before and, and certainly had interacted with the mayor and Jason, uh, Councillor Whiting and I um, have a, a long friendship as, as do you and I with, with uh, working on Richard Starkey's campaign. So, so I knew them and, and I knew a lot about them and um, they were just so warm and welcoming and the city leadership whatever you need counselor, you know, they're, they're so generous to me. So I, I think when I said that they asked my questions was for me to go realize that oh, I had the right question to ask. Okay. Them. See, that's where I was just getting confused, but thank you. Yeah. They asked that question. So I'm on the right track. And, and then it kind of gives me that confidence to, to go ahead and, and, you know, ask the questions that sometimes I'm not quite sure how to word them. Uh, particularly with more technical uh, pieces that we might be looking at, but they always help me out. And um, I, I so appreciate the warm welcome that they've given me and the opportunities to learn that, that I've been provided. Fun right. fact, when you're elected in the city of Lloydminster to municipal council, you not only get to do the Saskatchewan elected official courses, but you get to do the Alberta ones. So, <laughs> so we, we we have to do double. And, why why and is so, that? Why is that? Do you mind me asking? Just because you are the border city or because you have yeah. rules and responsibilities We're, in Alberta as well? We Because we, we have responsibilities in both provinces and it's a little bit in, different in both provinces. And so they want you to have that learning. So through SUMA, um, Saskatchewan Urban Municipalities, they run an education program for elected officials. So we take that program and I think there's eight courses. And then through Alberta, through Alberta mun municipalities, we do their elected officials um, program as well. And so I have two left in that one and I'm not quite sure where I'm at in the Saskatchewan one, but I, I'm making progress for well, sure. But I can imagine they'll be done shortly. Before we move on to our second segment, I wanna ask this last question in this segment. And this is the work-life balance. As an elected official, you are there to represent your constituents. You're there to represent your residents. And that means when you go to the grocery stores, your job is not done. People will come up to you if they know who you are. If you go out to dinner with your family, they will stop you from time to time and ask you questions. How has that been for the last two years, challenging that work-life balance? Because I can imagine you you put yourself into this role 100%. I know who you are, and I know that's what you do on a regular basis, but you always want some downtime. So how have you found that work-life balance? Well, I guess it depends if you ask me or my husband about that question. <laughs> So, you know, the first year we were still in COVID and so we weren't doing a lot of community events, but but post COVID as we're starting to be more active in the community and, and have opportunities, I, I have found it to be a little bit challenging still working full time, but um, really fortunate that I'm able to kind of flex my time and, and be able to still manage both jobs. I, I thrive on people. 
And so when someone, you know, we back onto a pathway in our backyard and, and when someone stops to talk over the fence or to, you know, one day a lady stopped and she said, come down off your deck. I need to talk to you. <laughs> I was like, oh no. But anyhow, we had a great conversation and I really appreciate that they're willing to share um, their concerns. And I always encourage them to, what's your solution? What, what would you suggest that we do? And so it's, we, I, I thrive on those conversations and the energy that that gives me. And every once in a while you get a, I got a jar of Saskatoon's and a little thank you card on my, my front porch one day saying thank you for being such a treasure in our community and we just appreciate all you do. And I was like, oh my gosh, I needed that. And um, this year has been especially uh, challenging. Our daughter got married in June and uh, living in Toronto, so came home for the wedding. And, you know, I'm the mom that wants to be the hostess with the mostest. So lots of lots of wedding planning there. And I loved every minute of it. And then right after the wedding, my mom went into palliative care. So we were caring for her six hours away. Um, much of the summer I was there and, and trying to manage all of my responsibilities for my job, my family, uh, council, and um, making sure that I was caring for my mom. So, so this year has been really challenging. But again, people have been so gracious in saying, you don't need to do this. Somebody else can pick that up for you. And you just focus on what's really important. And that's, that's family. Yeah. That is true. <laughs> family is the most important thing in the world. Um, yeah. I, wanna, I wanna turn to our next segment and that is the city of Lloydminster as a whole. And I preface this this segment with this, and I've said this every single ever since we had aired our first few episodes of this month long series. This is a conversation between the counselor and myself. This is not a direction of counsel. This is not a, a motion from counsel. This is her opinion. And it's not a direction. So please, if you have a comment that this is not a this is not an issue on counsel, it's not because it's a opinion from the counselor. It may be something that's being worked on, but it's an opinion. Nonetheless, I ask this question. Counselor Marin, what in your opinion is the biggest issue facing the city of Lloydminster today? Oh, you know, we, we have a few. And um, I think funding, you know, accessing funding for some of the, the infrastructure that needs to be built in our city uh, would be one of our top priorities in, in terms of getting provincial, so that's both governments providing funding as well as the, our federal uh, governments providing funding to some of the infrastructure needs. Um, roads, <laughs> roads are always up there. Uh, for me, it's, it's things like making sure we have a safe community and so, uh, you know, that we have the right level of RCMP um, in our community, serving our community, that people feel a sense of belonging to community, and, um, and of safety in the community as well. So, so balancing, I think it's important that we balance those. Both are big issues because we can't have a vibrant and growing com community if people don't feel a sense of belonging and feel safe in their community. So balancing that with, we need to advocate um, for our community. The other really big issue that we're facing, and, and this isn't a municipal issue, and yet we're serving the people of our community who are very much impacted by healthcare. And so it's a, it's a challenge because we have a bi-provincial health agreement in Lloydminster. Saskatchewan Health Authority provides the health services to the city with funding support through AHS. But when we have a gap in our services in our community, who takes responsibility for that? So sometimes we might hear something like SHA might say, well, um, that's an Alberta issue. Or HS says, no, we pay Saskatchewan to provide that level of service. And so the basket of services are even different from one province to the other. And so our expectations, if you're an Albertan living in Lloydminster, is that you would get the same level of services that if you lived in a similar sized city, well, it's a little bit bigger, but a Medicine Hat or a Red Deer or something like in Central Zone or Red Deer. Even if you we were in Vermilion, like if even if you were down the road, you would mm -hmm. expect the same level of service in Vermilion as you do in Lloydminster mm -hmm. if you lived in Alberta. Well, let me give you a big issue. So Camrose is half of our size and Camrose has 10 mental health uh, transition beds. Lloydminster, 31,000 plus, 32,000. And we have 
how many? Zero. We have zero. Yes, and so, so when we really look at what people's experiences living in our community, um, we have to become advocates for our community. And, and I think we've done such a great job, not just us as council, but councils before, and, and in particular our residents and our community agencies in collaborating to make sure that people don't fall through the gaps, that we're advocating for what we need in Lloydminster. And I see this tremendous uh, synergy between our agencies who are, are doing what's best for individuals and families in our community, rather than looking at what's maybe best financially for their organization. And so lots of collaboration going on and, and seeing tremendous opportunities presented because of that. Now, I, I don't want to speak at a turn here when I ask this question, but I, residents don't care whose issue it is. It's your issue. It's your issue as the elected official. They don't care that the AHS and SHA aren't talking to each other. They want a counselor to fix it because they're not looking at it as a provincial issue. They're looking at it as a my issue. So when you're dealing with issues that aren't in the municipal realm, but are a provincial issue or even a federal issue, how do you work through that? Because they're not coming to you and saying, okay, pass me to whatever uh, minister or MLA that is the responsible for this. I want you to fix it. So how do you balance that? And how do you work through that? Oh, such a great question. And <laughs> so because I, I am a natural advocate, um, when people come to me with those, those issues, we're the closest to them of an of a elected official. So we live in their community, we're here with them, they see us at events and um, we may work with them or, or we certainly run into them in the grocery store and restaurants, as you said before. And so they do want us to fix it. And so there's an opportunity there for a little bit of education. But I always like to say to people, so how could we tackle this together? Or I know this working group that's working on this issue and perhaps you'd like to be part of it or at least share your story and your ideas, your solutions, your, what you would suggest we could do for change. And I really encourage people to become advocates for themselves and advocates for our community. And if we just complain and we don't step out of that box to share our story and to say this is how things are really happening in Lloydminster. Healthcare is one of the big issues, but this is what, what we're experiencing. There won't be change. We're, we'll be the forgotten border city. And so we have to individually and collectively have a good plan to advocate. So I always like to say, well, let's come with a solution. We're gonna share our story and, and how challenging things are or where the gaps are but then we can offer a solution. And I was so bold to say to a minister one day, your investment is in the wrong place. It's great that you're investing in this, but you're making the investment in the wrong place. And then, well, because, so they were investing money in um, treatment services for addiction, for substance use disorders. That's great that they're doing that, but then someone comes through treatment of seven to 10 days and they come back to their community and nothing's changed for them. And they need the recovery supports. So, so finally, we're starting to see more talk about recovery and recovery supports in Alberta. And there's a new model that's opening up in Red Deer. But those are the kinds of things that we have to just be bold and say, thank you for your investment, but you're doing it in the wrong place. What about this idea? And I invited the Minister of Health and the Associate Minister of health um, from Saskatchewan when we were at SUMA, come to Lloyd Minister. We can share with you some solutions that you could scale up provincially and things that are working really well. And, and they came this summer and, uh, and Mayor Albers was able to engage well with them. Our Minister of Health from Alberta, Jason Copping came to Lloyd Minister. I got an hour of his time, which was incredible wow. to be able to talk about um, big ideas. Right. So so that's our job. Listen to community, understand really well what the issues are, hope to gain from them some solutions and then take that up, whether we support them to take it up or we do that on their behalf. That I see that as one of my roles. I, I don't want to be disrespectful with this question, but I'm going to have to pose it in a way that is nice, but not nice at the same time. 
how Hopefully. hard it, how hard is it to work between two provinces because i can imagine when you're looking for infrastructure funding you you want you want the best for your city and you're you you talked about the one city one vision uh, motto or one city and i apologize if i got that one wrong team. one city one team but you are in two provinces and sometimes Alberta may say, well, it's not our issue. It's an El Saskatchewan issue. And it's not a Saskatchewan issue. It's an Alberta issue. But you have to look for the best of your city. And you talked about infrastructure funding. When you're approaching infrastructure funding, do you approach provinces differently and say, well, Main Street or 49th Avenue on this side of the province or on the Alberta side needs to be paved. So we need to go approach funding for the Alberta province for this funding. And then on the Saskatchewan side, we have to go approach them for another. So you're double dipping, but you're also doubling up on resources of what you're trying to do because provinces may not look at you as a border city and they may look at one side as theirs and one side as the other. Or is that where that uh, memorandum of understanding between the border city comes into play with the two provinces? Yeah, so the charter certainly charter. does speak to many, the charter speaks to many things um, that you've, you've mentioned, but uh, we we do we do approach both provinces for um, their share of the funding to support one city, and you know we have twenty uh, one thousand I think Albertans living in Lloydminster and about ten or eleven thousand in the Saskatchewan side. I need to get those numbers in my in my brain. And so sometimes funding comes to our city based on the population from that province, and and so we have to try and manage that funding. Our city leadership, our admin team, uh, do a great job in preparing council to have conversations with ministers to talk about our priorities, to um, understand you know, where the funding issues are and, and, and our approach so that we're all saying the same thing. If we have an opportunity to meet with an MLA or a minister um, or an MP that we're all asking for the same thing and that we know what those priorities are. But it is significantly, it's a significant challenge um, being a border city. You have mentioned the issues that in your opinion are the most pressing to the city. Now, I guarantee you, if I go to Lloydminster today and I go ask people from across the, the city, their issues will not be the exact same issues that you have just mentioned. There might be some overlap, but they might say the pothole in front of their house, their driveway, mm -hmm. their, their road in front of their property, or their speed limit in their community area is their pressing issue. How do you balance the needs of the few, the people in your community, against the needs of the city? Because you are there to represent the entire city and not just your neighbors and your friends and your family members, but you have to look at the city as a whole. So how do you balance what the city needs versus what the individual person needs on an individual level? Well, I think it's important to listen to every individual to understand what their needs are and to kind of take note because maybe many people are saying that individually and, and all of a sudden we recognize that, okay, we need to pay attention to this because we're hearing it from a lot of people. Um, but I think, you know, in, in terms of the city, if we can deliver good governance, so if our council can deliver good governance and we're really paying attention to um, to providing a safe community, to building economic resilience. Um, what else? Environment and our infrastructure. So making sure that we underpin all those things that community has said is important. People will respect that more than the pothole that might be in front of their house. Having said that, that pothole might be an issue and we might have to come and do a patch there. So we always like it when people report a concern or, or tell one of us counselors that I want you to come and drive down the street to see you know how dangerous it is or, or how challenging it is to maneuver around the potholes now <laughs> we, we have that recently and and so then we then we can check in with our city team and and they might say oh that's deteriorated a lot since last time we looked at it so now we're going to put it on the list and next year when we do our list we'll drive by and and if it's at the top of the list and our within the money we have allocated we'll do that work so i i think it's it's making sure that we have a, a community where people have a voice because sometimes they just need to be heard. Sometimes they know there's no solution for it because we can't fill every pothole in the city. Um, but if they're heard and we're respectful of them and we do uh, 
our jobs to really manage the city finance as well and help to create the kind of community that they, they envision, I think we're going to be okay. How do you balance that though? Because right now we are in an economic mm-hmm. struggle. People are, the cost of living is out of control. Uh, inflation is at an all time high. And you are, I'm assuming, going through a budget consultation right now as every other city and municipality across this country is. Um, how do you balance the growth and the expansion of the city with not trying to injure or hurt the people who are there right now with a tax increase of say 4% or 3%. So we had lots of discussion in the spring when we were setting our meal rates. Um, You know, where were we gonna be short money? Uh, RCMP, you know, when we look at um, the back pay that we're responsible for and and that hasn't been sorted out yet, we're still hoping the federal government will come forward with money for that. But when we started to look at all of the costs and let me tell you, the costs associated with running the city or or doing infrastructure projects continues to increase. And it's it's a little bit shocking. And so how do we balance that? Um, Making sure we're connected, that we're listening, that um, I don't know that there's any magic way to balance that, but really managing the, the money that we have well and being strong advocates for investment in our community. So economic development, we know if we can attract more industry Um, to our community that it will support the tax base better so we won't have to increase those taxes and so our economic development team works really hard Um, it's amazing to see all of the things that they are working on and we just need a few of those to kind of close and 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 you know set up um, business in our city and and that will help us tremendously from either land sales or just um, you know the investment that they'll make in, in our tax assessment so we have that responsibility as well. Strategic Steps works with local municipalities, boards, and school divisions across Canada, providing guidance and expertise in governance, strategy, and sustainability. They work with clients to build on existing strengths, develop recommendations that are practical, sustainable, and strategic, and lead professional development sessions that drive organizational excellence and council and board member growth. From strategic planning to organizational and governance reviews to governance workshops and more, Strategic Steps has the tools, experience, and expertise to help your organization reach its goals and set itself up for future success. To book a consultation or learn more about Strategic Steps Incorporated, visit strategicsteps.ca today. I want to turn to our last segment because I'm just cautious of time here and we're at the 40 minute mark and I have a few questions in this last segment for you. And it's the fun segment. This is the segment I enjoy because I know your, I know your city. I've lived in your city on both Alberta and Saskatchewan side, but I like to learn this a little bit more about this from the people who represent it. Councillor Marin, we have two, we have a weird following in all of parts of Canada, in the United Kingdom, in Ireland, and in Germany. If I was a tourist coming to the city of Lloydminster mm-hmm. tomorrow, what unique hidden gems should I be looking at? What tourist attractions should a tourist automatically put on their list to go see in Lloydminster? Well, you know, surprisingly, we have quite a lot. But I would say, first of all, you have to experience the, the very tall border markers. <laughs> and, and so we have people coming and standing in front of the border markers and they'll go this side and we're in Alberta and this side we're in Saskatchewan and people have a lot of fun with that. And, and they just can't even wrap their head around, how can we be in two provinces in one city? And, and even people will ask, do you have a council for Saskatchewan side and a council for Alberta side? So there's lots of, you know, things that they can learn. Uh, we just opened a new museum. So the Lloydminster Museum and Archives is uh, just tremendous in telling the story of Lloydminster. And so um, I'm so, so impressed with it. And I want everyone who comes to our city to visit that. Uh, you can see behind me uh, a picture of Bud Miller Park. It is a treasure, a hidden gem in our city. 
And we are the envy of many, many cities um, that I, you know, people I talk to across the provinces, both of them, when they come, they're like, wow, you guys have this most amazing park. And so that for me is a, a must see. Um, what else would we have? One of the best fireworks display mm-hmm. I have ever seen oh. in my life on Canada Day, Bud Miller Park. If you are in the Lloydminster area, I highly recommend it just for that little shameless plug there. Well, and even coming in for Canada Day, all of the activities that we have in our community, our community really gets behind it. And we have lots of organizations and agencies along with our city team that put on a spectacular Canada Day event. Um, we also have uh, on, on August long weekend, a great event here at the museum and um, the cultural center. So you can go out and, you know, they'll have maybe uh, haymakers out there and um, lots of farming things and you can just have a good old, you know, pancake breakfast. We also have the Lloydminster exhibition. So if you want to come in to bull sales and have that experience, concerts, uh, 4-H expos, boy, we got some great stuff all the time happening up at Lloydminster um, exhibition. Um. After a long day of a council meeting, after a long day at work, after a council meeting, life has just got you down. Where's the one place that you can go in Lloyd and Minster that you can just decompress? Is it a park? Is it a walking trail? What's the one place in town or the city that you can go to? Well, I tell you, I'm so privileged to live on Messam Lake in Lloydminster. And we have a walking trail behind us and our, our yard backs the, the lake. And um I have a hundred baskets of flowers. So after that long day, every day you can find me in my backyard, um, deadheading flowers, talking to people. I have a free little library on my back fence that brings people in to to chat with. Um, I love love that ability to connect and and that ability to have hands in my dirt. It's really good for my mental well-being. And then you can take a nice walk around around the lake as well. So that is very much my happy place. And my last question before we wrap up here, Councillor, is this. And take as much time as you want to think about this, and then you can answer. But I'm assuming since you are a strong advocate for your city, you already know what the answer is going to be. And the question is, what makes the city of Lloydminster such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Well, there's a few things, but I'm going to say the people. So we have people who have lived here um, for generations. You know, they might be fifth generation uh, Lloydminsterites. And, and so they're very invested in community. But we've been able over the last 10 years or so, really welcome a lot of newcomers to our city. So people who were immigrating either to the first time for Canada or um, coming in from another province. And they just have really expanded Um, the cultural exposure that we've had in our city. We have some great cultural events, part of Canada Day as well. And, um, but the people, they're so invested in in creating a community. Um, I am part of the Lloydminster Area Drug Strategy and and our vision is to create a community where kids can grow up great, every kid, every day. And I see people every day building the assets of children and youth, helping our seniors to get connected um, you know, Councillor Fagnan, he has the Border City Connects and he runs the, the handy van buses and he's just so invested in that and, and seeing all of that grow and really be responsive to what the community needs are. I could go on with all the councillors, how they're investing in community, but I think it's our people that make Lloyd Minster such a special place to be. And then we have these great um, organizations, businesses that see the value in investing in community. And so they're funding things like a shelter, they're funding things like the Lloydminster Youth Council, they're funding things like um, the Handy Van or uh, initiatives for seniors, uh, mental health initiatives, Project Sunrise. Um, You know, we raised a lot of money to really address mental health issues in our community. And we're doing that. And we're doing it because people in our community are invested in having a great place to live, to work, and to play. Councillor, I am (laughs) so honored to have you on the show. Um, Thank you so much for spending the last 50 minutes. Yes, I said only 40 (laughs) minutes, but it has been 50 minutes because that's what happens when you have two old friends getting together and talking about politics. Time flies. So thank you so much for doing this. It's been an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show. 
Chris, thank you so much for the invitation. It, it feels like 15 minutes, not 50 minutes. And I, I feel like we could chat all day, but I have, um, I'm have i very honored that you you asked me to, to join you for today's conversation. Well, I want to thank everyone for tuning in for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown, a municipal month. Um, I want to remind everyone, put down your Twitter put down your Facebook, put down your Instagram and go have a conversation with somebody. Mm -hmm. It helps our society. It helps our democracy and it helps us be better at the end of the day. So with that, this has been the cross border interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember everyone keep talking. Mm -hmm.